Richard Garriott is the founder of the commercial space flight and video game industries and is a flown astronaut. He co-founded Space Adventures, the only firm to arrange space flights for private citizens. In 2008, Richard became the first second generation astronaut. Garriott, who also has been down to visit the Titanic and to the South Pole, authored the Ultima series and has been inducted into the Computer Gaming Hall of Fame, Woo! received the industry's Lifetime Achievement Award, and is credited with creating massively multiplayer games, MMORPGs. His coming book, Explore, Create, coming out January 2017, chronicles his early video gaming through his space flight to the present. Richard Garriott. Well, good evening, everybody. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I personally really enjoyed the movie we just saw. Oops, I'm having, let's see, there we go. Get my slides back on. You know, I, uh, uh, I expect a, a lot of you who are at least close to my age kind of grew up during that Apollo era. Uh, and some of the things, some of the slides you'll see here are actually of my time during that period, period as well. And one of the, I think the really great things about the movie we just saw was to really uh, show just what amazing work and talent was put into the space program, you know, starting with the Apollo era and before, uh, that is, is really what I grew up with. It was really so formative to, to my journey, which you'll, you'll see through here. You know, uh, 50 some odd years ago, when, when Sputnik became the first man-made item to, uh, object to leave uh, the Earth and orbit the Earth, uh, that, of course, was not only the beginning of the space age, but that is literally what inspired my father to become an astronaut. He, he was a professor at Stanford University running a, uh, a radio communications uh, uh, experiment site, uh, listened himself personally to Sputnik flying by, uh, and his skill and expertise in satellite radio telemetry uh, both inspired him and is also why he got hired was because he had that expertise. Uh, which obviously was, would become very relevant during the, the space era. And if you look at that first 10 years, you know, starting with Sputnik through landing on the moon, you know, in 10 years, we did a lot. We, not only the United States, we humanity went from being earthbound to living on the moon all within about 10 years. I mean, really just a, a, a stunning amount of progress in the first of those 50 years. And What's interesting about that is since then, you know, we've obviously done a lot of other great things in space, but still only just over 500 people. I was actually the 483rd person to leave the Earth. My dad was like number 36. And uh, it's just shocking to me how few people have, have left the Earth even after 50 years. But one of the things that Apollo did especially well is it inspired people to get involved in science, technology, engineering, and math. The thing that we try to get our kids inspired about now I would argue that my generation was absolutely inspired very strongly by that. And, and we've seen it. I was part of this technology revolution that I think came out of uh, this uh, you know, post-Apollo uh, boom. Uh, but what's interesting about that, though, is that you know, a lot of us grew up watching you know, Stanley Kubrick's 2001, and we all thought that this was the future of humanity, was to have these large orbital space stations big enough to generate their own gravity by rotation. And of course, 2001 was now 15 years ago, and we're nowhere near having anything like that. And so, you know, at least for, for a lot of folks in my generation, it's easy to kind of be bummed out about that and go like, hey, well, you know, what happened? And, you know, where did this inspiration go? Well, how, did this, how, did the, how did we stall after just this, this first 10 years? And, you know, as I reflect on it, I think one of the important things to reflect on is the fact that, you know, if you, if you have an, uh, uh, something you could go do that is both incredibly expensive and incredibly dangerous, then it wouldn't be that surprising that it's also pretty rare. And th that calculus is what has held back hum humanity's uh, push into space, uh, I at least would, would argue. And, and if you look about the 30 years that we've been stuck in low Earth orbit since uh, we went to the moon, you know, you, you look at things like the ISS, and you know, it cost us somewhere between 50 and 100 billion dollars to assemble it. It cost us two billion dollars a year just to keep it from splashing down to the ocean. 
It costs us somewhere in the neighborhood of $100 million per astronaut to put someone there. And so if you look at that number, you go, boy, you, you better find something pretty darn valuable to do there to justify this incredibly high level of expense. And, and I'm going to start, I want to be very bullish at the end of my talk, but I'm now at the beginning, I'm going to be fairly critical. I'm going to go, that is, a, again, a tough calculus to justify. Whether you're a taxpayer or whether you're trying to think of good science to do, if, you, if you're going to do even fundamental, worthwhile fundamental science, but you've got to cover that expense nut, that is a very difficult justification to make. And, but but that's what I, this is what I grew up in. And so I'm going to switch tracks a little bit and, and talk about the fact that uh, you know, my, my father was actually hired to go to, to go to the moon. He was one of the first scientist astronauts originally slated to go to the moon. And when they shut down the later half of Apollo, his first flight instead became Skylab. He flew again on STS-9. Uh, and uh, you know, he was a Capcom on Apollo 13, actually. We, just, we were just on the movie we just watched. And so I grew up not only hearing these stories firsthand, but when my father was on, on orbit, we had squawk boxes in our house where we'd hear the live communications from the ground to space unfiltered um, and would get briefings from NASA about you know, how to expect to hear about a lot of malfunctions. And there always are malfunctions. There were malfunctions in my own flight. And um, uh, you know, how not to get uh, you know, too worked up about those and how they would work those problems was sort of, a, again, a part of my daily life experience. And in my case, I also had a mother who was a professional artist and, uh, and, for, and, and every summer I would learn a, a new form of art. And for me, that actually sort of uh, helped spawn the foundations of my career if you, in, in computer gaming. I, if you look at computer games, I think of them as the quintessential high-tech art. And I had one of the high, you know, the, the, a singular high-tech father and a great high, uh, art mother. And that led me to building my computer game companies. I've, I've built and sold two of them, and I built my third that I, that I work on right now. Actually, my office is literally right through that ceiling there. I'm the, I'm the office directly above this room, uh, and uh, is where I do uh, create, create my next games. But along that journey, I was also interested in exploration. I'm on the board here at the Explorers Club. Um, I've always, uh, something, I'm, a habit I think I picked up from my dad is the, the desire to go explore. Uh, I, uh, and, and of course, I've always had an eye towards uh, space. Uh, but in addition, a lot of other terrestrial activities. Uh, I think you, uh, Jim mentioned in my introduction there that I'd been down to uh, uh, the Titanic and the South Pole and hydrothermal vents and a number of other uh, destinations. But I would also describe myself as there was a, a documentary, another great space documentary called Orphans of Apollo. And I, 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 I elected to that term to describe people such as myself and probably many of you here of people who were inspired by Apollo to get involved in STEM activities. Uh, and for many of us orphans of Apollo, I would argue that after you know, we were inspired by Apollo to go be successful entrepreneurs and high tech you know, uh, leaders, and then many of us have turned around and taken our success in high tech and turned it right back over into helping to advance commercial space flight. And uh, you know, not just me, but uh, you know, I'd argue Elon Musk is that same way, uh, Jeff Bezos the same way, uh, and you know, uh, even smaller folks like John Carmack of Armadillo Aerospace. Uh, he was a competitor for the X Prize. He's another game maker like me, uh, doing that same thing. S same general age, same general arc. But, but for me, you know, I I caught this bug a little bit deeper. You know, I think everybody grows up thinking, when I grow up, I'm going to be an astronaut or a paleontologist or a fireman or policeman. And we, you know, you, you kind of cycle through those, but then most people move on to other things. Well, you know, my father was an astronaut. My left-hand neighbor was Hoot Gibson, another shuttle astronaut. Right-hand neighbor, Joe Engel, another astronaut. Over the back fence was yet more astronauts. I lived in the neighborhood of all the folks you just saw in the, the documentary you just watched. And, uh, and, and so for me, it wasn't one of these things that you had to decide to go to space when you grew up. It just sort of felt like everybody goes, right? You, did, you know, whatever else you're doing in life, you're also going to go to space. And, uh, uh, and, and for me, there was this interesting event that happened when I was about 13 years old. One of the NASA doctors, who was the doctor for all astronauts' families, told me that because I needed glasses at the age of 13, I was no longer eligible to be an astronaut. And he just said it and went on his merry way, not realizing that he had just kicked me out of the club that my parents and neighbors and everyone that I knew was a member of. And so I was crushed. Prior to that moment, I would have never said when I'm going to grow up, I'm going to be an astronaut. But I just, you know, since I assumed we were all going, I, I thought I was crushed being kicked out and went through the standard, you know, seven stages of grief. 
And, uh, but eventually he said, you know, my solution to it was, well, I'm gonna, you know, who's that doctor to be the gatekeeper of space? If I have to make my own space agency one day, I'm going to, and I'm gonna find my way to space. So I've been singularly devoted since the age of 13 <laughs> to find my way into space. And you know, at the age of 13, you don't do much about it, but since I had fortunately a good career and still have a good career in computer gaming, that allowed me to build a variety of uh, space companies uh, that ultimately has opened the door for commercial space flight. And uh, uh, obviously in q and I can talk about some more of those in details if you like. But suffice to say that uh, uh, Space Adventures was kind of the key one of that list where, uh, uh, where I, I built that company. Interestingly, uh, in 2000, I was actually slated to be our first client to fly in 2001, but that's also when the internet stock market crashed. And so tragically, I had to sell the first private citizen seat to Dennis Tito, who became the first private citizen to go. I had to build another company, sold another company, and then as soon as I could afford it, I squandered the, the, basically all of my net worth in order to go to space. And, and so I committed to my own flight in 2007. And uh, what's interesting too is, you know, once you've committed to a flight, one of the first things you have to do is give an enormous amount of money to Russia. And by the way, you're not gonna get that money back. And then you go through medical prequalification. And in my case, they found a disqualifying medical condition. And so I got a phone call saying, sorry, Richard, you're out. So not only have I waited forever, built all these companies, already, already gave away all my money, and then I was told you're not gonna be able to fly. I got another call a couple hours later saying, we have a solution for you. And the solution implies that in 48 hours, you have to go under the knife and you, the, 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 the problem is that I had one lobe of my liver that was missing the vein that drains it off. And if you were in space and there was a collision between spacecraft, which has happened, that that would, could cause a depressurization event, which would cause internal bleeding, which you could neither detect or fix, so it would be fatal. And so I actually had one lobe of my liver removed uh, in order to even begin my training. Uh, so. Uh, and, uh, and, and even though you know, I flew privately, and I know a lot of people who fly, fly privately are referred to as space tourists, you know, I actually don't like that term for me. There are other people who don't mind it at all, like Charles Simone, one of the co-founders of Microsoft. He flew just before me and just after me, and he calls himself a space tourist. He believes what he did was tourism. In my case, I built the company to fly people there. I did, as you'll see, a very heavy workload of both commercial and scientific activities. I think I am a you know, a, a literal private astronaut. I did this as a commercial endeavor. Uh, I earned a fair bit of money back, which I'll talk about here in a minute with my trip. Uh, and so, I, anyway, I prefer the term private astronaut. But, uh, you know, if, if you're gonna fly on the Soyuz, there is no passenger seat. You, you, there's work that you have to do. I actually board the vehicle first, turn it on, manage the power supplies, manage uh, all the life support, all the suit uh, uh, air conditioning and pressure uh, is all managed from, from my side. But you had to learn all the systems on board Soyuz. You also have to learn all the systems on board both the Russian and US segments of the ISS. You had to go through open sea survival training. That was actually, if there's anything that's hard about training, that's it. That is painful, uncomfortable, uh, fr frankly dangerous, uh, and, uh, uh, but still uh, a lot of fun. And, and then I had to pass the same final exam. So there are tests. Uh, I had to literally go through with the, both solo and with my crew. We had to pass both individually and, and as a crew all these tests or we wouldn't have been able to fly or at least not fly together. Uh, and then finally on October 12th, so just uh, earlier this month, eight years ago, I uh, uh, became, as I had mentioned earlier, the 483rd person to, to uh, leave planet Earth. And I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm often asked how long it takes to get to orbit. And, the answer is not long, about 510 seconds, so about eight and a half minutes. From the, from the moment the engine's light to you have burned 90% of the mass of that vehicle and ejected a couple of stages, uh, just 510 seconds. I mean, it's just an amazingly fast ride from the ground to being in orbit. Uh, and all, of course, uh, because you're accelerating so quickly, about, uh, you're accelerating with the force of about uh, three and a half Gs the whole time. <clears throat> And for two days, I lived bo on board the Soyuz vehicle itself. They've actually changed that in, in recent years. The, re the reason why you don't go immediately and dock with the space station is they want to make sure that you have good command and control authority over your Soyuz so you don't smash into the station. 
And so you spend about a day, you, or at least you did in my time, um, checking out the systems on board the Soyuz before you push anywhere close to docking. They now have enough confidence in it, they actually launch directly into a near orbit with the space station and they dock within a few hours. So it's, I think it's about six hours from uh, engine light, light to docking, which is pretty darn fast. Um, in my case, I docked two days later, they're on October 14th. And uh, you know, when you get on board the space station, the station is pretty cluttered. This little green spot attached on the wall is officially my office. Put a few of my patches and memorabilia there. My experiments were laid out here, and there's a window you can't quite see on the floor down here, which is the main menu window I worked out of. But you can see there's gear packed on all four surfaces, you know, stem to stern, and that's stem to stern of a vehicle that's about the size of a football field. So it is packed with junk. And, uh, and when I say junk, I mean a lot of it really is junk. Anything anybody's ever brought up is still up, and uh, and often in duplicates. So like camera lenses or screwdrivers, you know they've had, they've had they've tried to do inventory control down through the years with all kinds of automated systems, none of which have they've all been abandoned after the first year or two. So uh, yeah, there's there's both useful useful things, well stowed and well organized, but also a lot of uh, uh, stuff that's been just kind of left behind by previous trips, and. Uh, then, uh, you know, when, when you do things like the life on board, if you, this is the galley, the little table right here in the Russian segment, and it's meant for three people, a person on the far side, a person at the end, and a person would be on the near side. So it's really built for three people, but the nominal uh, size of a crew is six. And so you tend to cram people not only around the galley, but also float on the ceiling. And so that's the, in order to get enough people around the, around the dinner table. Uh, and sleeping, sleeping on board is also a bit of a trick. You know, uh, most people actually find it quite pleasant. I actually am one of the rare people that found it more difficult to sleep on orbit, and I think it's because on, on Earth I sleep face down and well wrapped. And uh, But most people just, can you just relax and take the fetal position and, you know, there's no head nodding or anything else, no pressure points. So most people find it quite comfortable. I found it hard to ever feel like I was on a pillow or anything. I kept, you know, take a towel and roll it up, put it under your head, and then you float away from it. You know? And so I used bungee cords to kind of hold myself against the surface. Uh, I will save this story for the end, if we have time in the Q&A. Uh, you know, there's a lot of really great reasons to go to space. Uh, the food and personal hygiene are not two of those reasons. And, uh, uh, and you know, there are books written about how to go to the bathroom in space, but they all lie. Uh, because they all tell you the sanitized training list of activities. They don't tell you the actual practical problems of pooping in space, which I'm happy to share with you if you like. Uh, but uh, this is the experiment and uh, activity load that I took on, uh, th which is one of the main reasons I, I don't, again, like the term space tourist for myself. I'm going to call out just a few of them. One of them is protein crystal growth, which I'll come back to as to why that's important. Um, another one is a piece of software I developed called Windows on Earth, which is, uh, was first used by me on my flight, but now has become the standard tool for Earth observations photography on orbit. Uh, this uh, personal, uh, uh, this, this eye test, uh, it was fascinating that, if you remember the beginning, I mentioned that NASA, one of the NASA doctors told me that because uh, I had needed eyesight, I, I was never going to be an astronaut. Well, in the intervening years, I've had what, what is now called LASIK these days, but it was uh, photorefractive keratotomy when I did it. And that is not approved for NASA astronauts or, or astronaut candidates. But I didn't fly as a guest of NASA. I flew as a guest of Russia, who is happy to take the money and let me risk my eyes if I wished. And so, uh, but when NASA heard that I was flying and was going to be the first person ever who's had corrective eye surgery to fly, they said, hey, we would like to study your eyes because we actually <laughs> want to approve this for NASA astronauts, but we've never had a test case because we don't allow it. And so I agreed to be the guinea pig, and we did this incredible battery of tests before, during, and after my flight, and now it is approved for NASA astronauts to have had corrective laser eye surgery. So, yeah. But uh, I also, of course, find some irony you know, in, in all that as well. Um, you know, on the subject of, pro of protein crystal growth, uh, uh, super, I can go into this in the Q&A deeper, but super briefly, uh, you know, a, a lot of modern medicine is a, uh, a, a molecule and pill form that you will swallow that is referred to as a ligand, a, a molecule to bond very tightly with a disease-causing protein. And so if you, wanted, if you want to design one of these medications, 
it is very useful to know the exact structure of the, of the protein causing problems so you can imagine therefore designing a chemical that would meet up with it nicely and mate with it and, and stop that, that protein from doing that bad function. Well, and you do that with something called protein or a common method to determine the structure of a protein is called protein crystallography. But growing proteins into crystals on Earth is extremely difficult because the phase change from liquid to solid as a crystal usually gives off a little bit of heat, which creates a little bit of turbulence, like in a pot of boiling water, which disturbs the growth of the crystal. They either grow more small or less pure. Uh, but if you grow those crystals in microgravity, they grow bigger and more purely. You get a better structure. You get it faster and it can accelerate the time to market for drugs. So this is one of the things that I think is actually of significant commercial value. Uh, it, it was actually started early in the shuttle era, but NASA is not a commercial, their, their mandate is not commercial development. And so uh, it would lift it up to us. Now that we have private people flying, we can pick up and continue these, these uh, commercialization bits of research. Um, uh, another thing I did is I, I, uh, I worked with the Nature Conservancy to try to show how in my father's time on Skylab to my time, 35 years of human spaceflight, how the Earth had changed. Uh, and we data mined out of the Skylab photo archive. So like, for example, here is a picture my dad took uh, of Miami, Florida from 1973. Here it is from when I took it. And you can see, again, the significant urban sprawl. And if you look at these, if you had more time to look at these more carefully, you could also see the drying up of the wetlands uh, and the panhandle. Uh, and so we try to do this, the, the, this comparative analysis to show both negative and we try to find positive stories that we could tell about how maybe good forestry techniques had uh, improved forests in some part of the world. Sadly, we actually could not find any. So uh, we found plenty of negative stories and we could not find a demonstrable positive story from space. So uh, just an interesting uh, uh, issue there. And then I mentioned that piece of software that, that I helped to develop called Windows on Earth. You know, if you're, uh, it's not uncommon for astronauts to be asked to take a picture of something happening on the ground, like a volcano is erupting or there's some event happening on the ground and we'd love to get a picture of it from space. Please go to the window and, and take a picture. The problem is this is what they get. An astronaut was used to be handed a printout and you know that the space station will be traveling this direction, which means that if you're trying to take a picture of Perth, Australia, it'll be out the left window and you sort of know the approximate time well, there's latitude, longitude, somewhere on here is the time that it says, you know, at 9.15 or whatever it might be, be at the window. But when you go to that window, you then have to go like, well, which way is the space station moving and which way is the piece of paper oriented to that? And then, you know, if you look out the window, it's, it's frankly really hard to tell exactly what you're looking at. And especially if you're like looking at generic mountain ranges to find the K2 versus Everest is very difficult. And in fact, there's the K2 versus Everest example. So like, okay, well, you know, K2 and Everest are in that shot. Good luck, you know, picking out which one. Although we probably have some explorers in here that might be able to answer that question, but I've never been able to answer that question. Uh, and so this is what we developed. We developed a, a piece of software that showed you exactly what was out the window, uh, the size of various apertures of lenses. Uh, there's the targets that you want to shoot. Here is a countdown timer that shows in seconds, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds ahead what, whether those things will be, what size lenses you want, and whether they'll be out to the left or the right, and even a day-night trans cycle that shows you the next few hours. And so it lets you set this laptop right by the window, and you can see exactly what's coming up. So you know, oh look, the next shot is gonna be a 50 millimeter lens. Let me switch lenses. So in two seconds, it'll be out slightly to the right side of the window, and you just take the picture. And so it lets you, instead of missing most every shot, it means you can take a list of thousands of shots in rapid fire order uh, and this, was, this tool was far, truly far better than anything they've been using on orbit. And so, as I mentioned, it's now the, uh, the standard tool. In fact, it was funny, even on my own flight, I was the junior astronaut. And so, you know, I'd be at the window a lot with my fancy tool. Yeah. The astronauts would come by with their pieces of paper going like, oh, you know, where do I shoot this? But I had, before I launched, I actually brought their targets into my tool. So my tool were in their targets. And then what they did is they started going, Richard, hate to do it to you, but you know we're the senior guys. We need the window. Can we borrow your tool? And so this is this. All, all I could do when they would kick me out is I got pictures of them using my window and my tools to take their shots. You know when I was kicked out. Um, you know another, uh, one of the fun things I did in orbit was uh, uh, experiments and answers for for kids. And so. Uh, uh, I'm not going to ask, the, the, some of the questions that were asked I thought were really great, so I'm going to see if you guys know the answer to this one, which is like one question I got asked was, is it hot or cold in space? Who thinks they know the answer to that question who's not been there? 
Raise your hand. Cold? No, neither. Neither? You like neither? Yeah. Who said neither? All right. So why, why do you say neither? Neither is a vacuum, so it can't, it can't be cold and it can't be hot. You are exactly right. And so, uh, you know, the, the, definition of, the definition of temperature is uh, the rate of vibration of a molecule. And so if you have a vacuum, there's no temperature by definition in vacuum. But of course, when kids are asking the question, they're really asking, well, I feel hot or well, I feel cold. And it turns out the answer is still not obvious because the fact that you're in a vacuum uh, has two side effects. One is that if I'm floating in the sunshine, the sun is going to heat my body up. The vacuum around me is a pretty darn good insulator. And so I'll get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. In fact, the way that if, if your ship gets disabled, the way you die generally in space, if you're in, on a ship or inside the ship or inside your spacesuit, but if you, if you had enough oxygen, is you will cook. You'll actually get too hot and you'll, you'll burn up. Uh, on the other hand, if you're on the shadow side of the Earth or you're on a spacewalk on the shadow side of the space station, for example, you're not getting any solar load on you and you are radiating away heat through infrared radiation. And you'll actually get colder and colder and colder and colder and you'll eventually freeze to death. And so it depends on whether you're in the sun or in the shade. If you're in the shade, you freeze, and if you're in the sun, you cook. And so that's why the uh, EVA spacesuits have these big, giant heater and air conditioners on them. I'll skip the other question for the end later. I also did some art in you know, homage to my mother, uh, which I can talk about later, too, for those who are interested. But you know, um, um, the one bit of advice that my dad gave me um, that was by far the most correct piece of advice was why and how I should be at the window looking back at the Earth. And he helped plan my schedule to where if it was a nighttime pass or it was over the Pacific Ocean where there wasn't much to see, I'd be doing experiments. But whenever it was daylight over land, I was at the window. And there was a term I'd never heard of until after my flight called the overview effect that is sort of this epiphany that people who have had a chance to orbit the Earth almost all experience, or the, 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 clearly the majority of people experience. And and I think it would be profoundly important for humanity to have this. And so my description will pale to the reality, but I think you'll get the gist of it. You know, when, you, when you're traveling in space, you're only, when you're in orbit, you're only 250 miles up. That's really not very high. It's only the distance from you know, here to Boston or something, you stood up on end. And that's only about 20 times higher than airplanes that we've all flown coast to coast in. And so when you look straight down, you know, that doesn't look that dissimilar to looking out the window of an airplane, right? You can see the airplane contrails and some clouds, and you're further up than most of the, you know, than most other planes would be by a good amount. But it, you know, but it's, it's not alien looking to you. And even when you pass over places you've been, you would known, like, you know, there's the Golden Gate Bridge. Excuse me, there's the Golden Gate Bridge. Where is the Golden Gate Bridge? Can't see it. And uh, there's Alcatraz, the Oakland Bay Bridge. Uh, there's uh, uh, Golden Gate Park. Uh, you know, here's a ship coming in, and if, you, if, if the monitor is good enough here, or the projector good enough, you can see the V-shaped wake of its, uh, of the, the wakes going going out of the of the bay, and uh, and so it was, it's amazing the level of detail that you can see, and uh, oops, hang on a second here. You know, when you uh, on the other hand, if you look horizontally out at the edge of the Earth, it's you can quickly tell how thin the atmosphere is. You know, only 10 or 20 times higher than the clouds. There's not enough atoms to even refract light. You. Uh, you know, when you look out at that limb, now, when you're looking out to the horizon, now it looks like you're really high, right? When you look down, you feel close. When you look to the side, you feel very high. And you notice how weather forms these giant laminar shapes if there's no land masses or temperature variation for them to run into. In the Atlantic, you see all these hurricanes forming because of the shallow, warm, warm seas. Uh, you can see how the ge ge geologic morphology of the Earth has changed over time. You can see how fault lines all interconnect all around the continents you're flying over. You see how water is just slowly removing mass off the continents and washing it out to sea. You, you can see how even eons of wind erosion have blown through mountain passes and created these things called desert fans that you couldn't even perceive on the ground but are only visible really from space. And, uh, and then eventually you know, you get back uh, uh, to uh, see places like this one. This is when I finally flew over my own home in Austin, Texas. And, uh, uh, and I'll come back to that pass here in just a second. That slide's a little bit out of order. You, 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 you notice when you fly over mountain ranges how there's roads and dams and uh, passes through all those mountain ranges. You see how humanity is t terraforming the earth, um, you know, with, the, in this case, the Palm Islands in Dubai. You see how in every desert on Earth, we're popping, pu pumping up fossil water to grow crops and, and ship it into cities. You, you can see how we're clear-cutting all the forests, uh, all in the Amazon. That was true since my dad flew in space. 
all across Africa, it's also true. And, uh, and for me, the, the, the slide that I meant to have just before this one was one of taking a picture of my house. It was, it was not until I'd been around the earth a couple hundred times that I flew over Austin, Texas and Houston, Texas where I grew up and I went to school and I've lived till I came here to New York. And so it's an area that I knew very intimately. I knew the distances between those cities very intimately. And, and now that I've been around the earth a couple hundred times, you're going, I now know the true scale of the earth by direct observation. And suddenly it was like being in a movie where they might dolly a camera back in a hallway but zoom the lens in on the actor. So the actor stays the same size in the frame but the hallway sort of collapses around them. That's the physical reaction I had to that moment. And it was such a big reaction I thought, immediately I thought, you know, I can't be the only one that's had this sort of momentary epiphany. And when I came back, had discovered this is a common thing called the overview effect. <clears throat> and it also makes you come down though and look at, you know, you, it, it's just so obvious that we are using up all the fresh water, that, you know, not only that is naturally falling on the surfaces, but is pumped up. You can pump up out of the desert, uh, this fossil water. Uh, that it, it is very true that, uh, you know, we're, we really are uh, exploiting fresh water close to, you know, its natural productivity level. Uh, and of course, we could get more by desalinating, but that throws back into an energy problem, which is our other giant problem on Earth is energy. And so, uh, even though I would have always, <clears throat> you know, described myself as an environmentalist before I went, uh, you know, it really makes you, uh, you know, double down on that uh, uh, pretty significantly. But eventually it was time to go. Got in another Soyuz with a different crew. Uh, had a, uh, uh, just a few hours this time to come down. You know, once you re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, you begin to uh, create a plasma that is hotter than the surface of the sun that you saw a little bit in the, in the earlier video. Uh, I've, I videotaped my own re-entry too. If people are interested later, we can pull that out and show it. I had some malfunctions on the way down, both this thing that dislodged, this is a big metal container that dislodged and pinned me and my seat from preparing, you know, from moving into the impact position before we hit the ground. Uh, we had some smoke come into the cabin uh, that uh, about the time that the heat shield uh, was, uh, was removed uh, that we never really did quite figure out. Uh, but then, uh, of course, in a Soyuz, you impact not on the water, but on the gr earth. And so you hit the ground going maybe 30 or 40 miles an hour in a six ton vehicle that hits the ground hard and then proceeds to bounce and roll. So it is a, you know, stunning, a literally stunning uh, finale to your uh, time in weightlessness. Uh, and in this case, my dad was there to help me out. He helped me board the rocket, ran my mission control team, helped me organize all my experiments. He was with the rescue helicopters to pick me up. So this was a cool bonding moment for us. And, uh, but now I want to take you into kind of why I think that even though I, you know, wasted, my, my wife might say, uh, you know, my net worth to take my first trip into space, uh, why I think not only will I get a chance to go back probably many times, but why I believe anybody in this room who also wishes to go will be able to do so. You know, if you look at every mature form of transportation, boats, planes, cars, and trains, they all cost about three times the energy cost to own and operate. And uh, so if you put a hundred bucks in gas in your car, it will only take you, you know, you have to pay another 300 in uh, depreciation and insurance. But if on the other hand, every time you filled up your car with gas, you crushed it and bought a new car, you wouldn't drive very often. And, and that is fundamentally the issue. If, you, if you're crushing every car every time you fill it up with gas, you're not going to use cars except for the most incredibly important functions you can imagine, uh, which would not be much. Uh, and the problem with the rockets is they've always been throwaway until recently. And SpaceX is doing you know, a pretty phenomenal job here now of already landing their first stage. They've landed on the ocean. They've landed it on land. Uh, he plans to use the escape capability uh, as a land for reentry capability, both on Earth and ultimately on Mars. And uh, he had plans. I haven't heard recently what he plans to do with his middle stage, but um, uh, the middle stage is actually the hardest to reenter because it needs a heat shield. It, it, it makes a full orbit, so it's a takes a, a bit more mass to put a heat shield on that and turn it around and land it right, right side up. But if he gets that, if he gets the majority, if not all the system working, he, he probably has already dropped the price compared to a ride on the shuttle. He's probably already dropped that from $100 million to about $10 million. I think he's going to planning to charge $20 million originally. But Elon has said to me personally, he thinks he can get the price down under $1 million. And if he succeeds at that, by the way, I earned, 
you know, I spent tens of millions to go, but I earned high ones of millions back with my uh, with those commercial works that I told you. If I can, if I can go for a million dollars, I can earn money. I can make money flying to space. And if I can do it, I'm sure there's others of you here who can. And if not you, there's other entrepreneurs out there who will be able to pull this off. So we are very close to the point where cost and benefit, just from a pure money in, money out economics, much less hard science or inspiration, turns around. Uh, and that's not even the end of efficiency. We also have uh, you know, chemical rockets carry all that fuel with them as they go into space. My wife uh, recently uh, was helping a company doing beamed energy propulsion, where instead of getting the energy to expand that gas out of the combustion of hydrogen and oxygen, you beam it with microwaves, directly heat a propellant to shoot out the back. So you only need a much smaller amount of propellant, you get a lot bigger heat, a lot more expansion, so you get much more powerful thrusters. Uh, we already have now a new technology for inter interplanetary travel, uh, another electronic, electromagnetic uh, thruster that's uh, being flown here in the next couple of years called Vasimir. That will shorten the time to Mars from you know, a nine month trip to say a three month trip, which in the, is important because of radiation exposure. Uh, that's the slide about my wife's uh, thing works, that you beam these, uh, you take power from the, it can be wind farms, store it in a battery pack, dump the battery pack through a gyrotron, beam that up through a, a dish that tracks the vehicle and heats up what is also used as a heat, uh, it's also the heat shield, but uh, you flow a propellant through the heat shield to cool it down and expand the, the gas as it uh, comes out the back. Um, but you can see how price is changing. You know, you look at the Saturn V, it was incredibly expensive. Already down here, the Falcon is the cheapest way to, you know, get, it's under $10,000 a kilo to put stuff in space. Falcon Heavy will drop it dramatically from that. And if things like this beamed energy propulsion get done, uh, it comes down to another factor of 10 lower. And so the floor, if you just think about the that, that original equation I said about the multiple of gas cost, uh, it's never going to be cheap for us to go to orbit. It's probably going to cost us, you know, 100 grand or better. But 100 grand compared to 100 million is a might bit easier to swallow. And especially if you can earn, if you can, if you're willing to do any work while you're up there, you can probably cover the cost. And uh, and once you're up there, you can stay basically indefinitely at you no know, additional cost or hardly any additional cost. And so uh, it, uh, we really are now in the decade or two March to make this much more affordable for, for all of us. And so here's what's happening is that price comes down. You know, we're gonna get below the amount of money that even I earned on my own flight, which is about five million bucks. And as soon as those are inverted, I expect the amount of money people will earn will, will go up uh, dramatically. And so I'll go through these last ones pretty quickly because it's about where I wanted to wrap up, but uh, on time. Uh, but uh, you know, it's interesting to, to see what this portends. We already have now a wide variety of suborbital vehicles being built. That's going to be open up things like space diving, which is one of the things I want to go do. Uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, not only is it we're already we already have commercial activity in low Earth orbit, but uh, you know we have four uh, orbital crewed vehicles coming into existence. We're man rating the other boosters we have here in the United States plus SLS. The ISS has already been turned into a national lab, uh, and there's now. Uh, private modules being added to it that will be under a completely different commercial uh, pricing regiment. Uh, again, there's going to be things to do like protein crystal growth. There's already a company, a friend of mine, it's a company doing vaccine development, which is also valuable. There's constellations of new kinds of satellites being put up, including you know CubeSats and the like. Uh, you know, space-based solar power, which is uh, in most of its forms has been a non-starter. Uh, I actually think there is a good argument for that now in these cases for very specialized conditions. Uh, I'm an investor in some of the asteroid mining stuff that's coming up. You know, the, uh, it's amazing how many asteroids there are that are even orbiting a Lagrange point very close to the Earth, so very easy for us to go pick up and bring back. And whether there's water or rare metals, I'm a fan of bringing back rare metals and throwing them down in the desert and uh, then picking it up out of the desert. Uh, then there's also things like, you know, just a few years, just a, you know, 13 years from now, there's a, you know, city destroying or maybe even a planet destroying uh, uh, asteroid that's going to come between the Earth and the Moon, so close to the Earth that its uh, its orbit is going to be bent dramatically by its pass, and then a few years later it's going to come back again, even closer. And so this uh, thinking of planetary defense is now you know a, a a real issue for us to be dealing with now that we can, and now that we really do understand the probabilities and frequencies with which things come by. Uh, and so you know it's interesting, even in the in the eight years since my flight. 
I've gone from saying from being bullish on us getting to Mars within 30 years to now I am bullish on getting to Mars within 10 years. I actually think we are now within a decade. And the great thing about being within a decade is if it's longer than a decade, no politician can fund it because neither them nor their subsequent politician will pay for it because somewhere along the lines there'll be a dip in the economy or a change of regime that will stop funding it. And so no one's willing to start funding it knowing it may not be finished and if it is they won't get any positive credit for it and so uh but they, they can only my mind be done within a decade and now we're within a decade and so that's why i think you're hearing some politicians start rattling about it that's why you're hearing elon musk rattle about it i actually really sincerely believe that if we if this generation of the people in this room want our country to be on mars within a decade we can do it and we can do it within the currently existing budgets no dramatic change in the budgets required just requires a uh, careful exercise of public-private partnerships. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, I haven't updated the slide. 30 years, it should say now 10 years. So that tells you how recently I've sort of changed that. I've changed my, my perspective to, to much uh, shorter. And ultimately, you know, I, I had the great pleasure of taking Stephen Hawking on a zero-G flight. Uh, and hopefully he'll get a chance to go into space here soon. But, you know, uh, he's I, I think he's supposed to be on one of the flights with Virgin Galactic. Yeah, they, he, and so uh, I'm sure he'll be with us for you know at least another 10 years. So uh, I don't know where he is in the queue, but I'll bet they'll let him cut to the front. If, uh, I, I think he's in the first like 20. Yeah, but uh, uh, but to me, you know, it, it's not. It's no longer a question of will we be able to go. It's now you know you should start planning. You know, and I, I've already started planning. I already own some property on the moon. I mean, literally, <laughs> not just one of these pictures you took of it, but I have a rover that's sitting there on the moon. And so, you know, I, I now think it's time for you guys to, to you know, where, what are you going to do? When, when are you going to go? How are you going to participate? This is now something, you know, I did this fully privately. You can too. It's getting easier. It's not getting harder. So I hope you do. And uh, oh, the, the last thing I want to show you, since I know the next session uh, is about UFOs, I have, a little, I have a little UFO story to share as my finale. So my father is one of the people that is quoted on the internet of having claimed to have seen UFOs. And it is my father's deepest regret in history, in his, of the history of his life, that he ever uttered those words. Uh, because what happened is things like this start coming out, that uh, people claiming that astronauts have seen UFOs. And there actually is one astronaut who literally does believe or did believe in aliens and was very public about it. And that guy was Ed Mitchell. And the majority of things you'll see on the internet who, uh, who make these sort of claims are from, at least most of the ones that I'm familiar with are from Ed Mitchell. Or there are things like this about my dad, uh, where uh, my dad goes, no, no, it was not ever meant to be aliens or anything. It was never a big mystery. It was, they knew pretty well what it was that they saw you know, out of the horizon uh, that they got some little blurry squiggle picture of. But he did utter the phrase, unidentified flying object. And so therefore, he is marked for life as a UFO believer. Uh, and, uh, and of course, these, these, these reputable places like the Tattler, you know, where the, uh, uh, the, the, the journal's bringing this up. But, uh, but, but, but regardless, I know the phenomenon is popular, and there's all kinds of interesting things uh, that happen in the world. And uh, I am a believer that uh, life must exist somewhere out in the gigantic universe we're in. I'm just not nearly as... Uh, uh, suspicious that uh, any has uh, had the chance to visit us here yet, unfortunately. But uh, we will see. And my last slide here is, uh, you know, uh, follow me on Twitter. And as uh, was mentioned at the beginning, I do have my first personal book coming out in January. But you can pre-order it starting now. Go to Amazon or your favorite bookseller. Look up Explore Create. And uh, hope you enjoyed my talk and hope you enjoy the book. Big hand for Richard Garrett. So we have a, about f four minutes for a few questions for Richard. So uh, anybody have any questions? Yes, you, sir. Uh, I've read that uh, Ross Cosmos is, is uh, underfunded in these coming years and that they're considering reducing the number of their cosmonauts on, on some of the Soyuz flights. Any idea what they're going to do with the spare seat? Uh, well, first, I think you're right that, uh, you know, um, Roscosmos in general makes lots of claims about, you know, building new launch facilities, which some of which they actually are doing, or having a new, I just was reading the other day about a new uh, uh, capsule and other things. But uh, so that they actually talk a good game and, in fact, I think put together some pretty nice plans, but they have a, a very difficult time funding any of them. And that's been true all along. And I, I think in this case, 
Uh, they are reducing their Cosmonaut uh, standard load from three to two. The, the majority of those extra seats will be sold to NASA. Uh, however, it does also mean that companies like mine will likely get a chance to uh, buy some in there too, which is what I hope, I assume. Although pretty soon Elon will undercut them, so we'll hopefully move domestically here shortly. Yeah, back there in the blue shirt. Richard, with so much focus on Mars, is this still a case for commercial space flight to the moon? I know Space Adventures used to sell this $100 million orbit ticket. And yeah, you know, so what's, actually, what's the tenure horizon there? Yeah, so the price now for, for Space Adventures to go around the moon is about $150 million. Uh, and we actually do have three clients who have put down deposits on that trip. We just need to uh, also help Russia get uh, the work pre-work done to be able to pull that off. Uh, to be able to run those flights. So, I, so a, a circumlunar flight, a free return flight, which is what we're planning t talking about, I think is marketable from a commercial standpoint. Uh, but if, you know, there's, there are some people who say we shouldn't go to Mars, we should go back to the moon, or you go to the moon and the way to go to Mars, and Europe and China, who have never been to the moon, do want to go to moon, the moon first, with or without us. And so for international relations, I think we might need to do some work on or near the moon to help other countries catch up. Uh, who we'll frankly want to have help us on Mars. Uh, but I personally am not a person who on our own as a country would, would prioritize the moon at all. I think that you know, NASA's job is to go someplace first, to explore farther and further each time. And if there's any real value there, then it's commercial industry's job to go back and do something with it. And I don't see a commercially compelling role at the moon yet, uh, although with lower costs that might change. Uh, and I don't see the moon as being an important stop for proving ground for going to Mars, personally. But it is an interesting debate. But uh, at least circumlunar flights could be commercial. Okay, one more question. Yes, you, Renata. <laughs> we call her Mighty Mouse in the centrifuge. <laughs> Hi, Richard. How are you? Good to see you. What about the balloons that we hear about? Yeah, the uh, Worldview folks who uh, might even have some here in the room that are involved with it. So wor Worldview is uh, uh, interesting at a number of levels. You know, when I first heard about it, having uh, I had recently gone to space, and so at first my initial reaction was, "Ha ha!" You know, I've been to space. This isn't you know as as interesting. Uh, but then I actually got to know the team and got to know what they could pull off, and I, my interest level has grown and grown ever since. Uh, the fact that if you, if you think about a suborbital flight, like a lot of folks in this room are signed up for uh, the Virgin Galactic flight, and by the way, I hope to make some of those suborbital flights too. But having been to orbit, you realize that there are things like the overview effect that took me hundreds of orbits before I really n had that impact. And so there's, there's being, having hang time is actually really important from a being able to take in the view of the Earth and what it means to you on a deep and personal level. And that's one of the, I think, one of the key advantages of worldview, it, or other things, other balloons that might be able to take you to these extreme altitudes. Uh, it's you know whether you cross the quote line of uh, space unquote is less relevant in this case than the hang time. The fact that you go to that altitude and spend the day there, I think, would be incredibly powerful uh, as a personal ex as a human experience. And so uh, I think uh, I'm very bullish on uh, the rationale. And, and the technology they've clearly got nailed. Uh, so uh, I think the, we should see them flying soon. I don't know when the first ones planned are, but uh, I wish them great success, and I think they will be. Now we come to that moment where we give the certificate oh. to Richard Garriott. Oh, this right here? Yeah, that's yours. Okay, come on up. So Richard's on the board here. Probably has a ton of certificates from God knows where, from the Explorers no. Club. He got one from, actually we did a Legends here a, a couple of years ago with Richard and, the, and his dad together and it was, it was a great, a great, and at, at that point he had showed us his scar, but we, you want, go ahead. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Anyway, Richard, um, just want to present you with this. Uh, <laughs> this, this. This is not a Donald Trump rally. This is <laughs> this is a classy group. Um, anyway, here's a, a, a Richard Garriott uh, a certificate. Thank you, Richard. You did a great job.